The bottom left quadrant is a functional experience, like you're using the product or you're using a website. And functional experiences have to be good, but they don't create a strong emotional connection. Hi, this is Matt, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive ROI from focusing on their CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Michael Folvio, who's the director of CX at Snipes, which is a really cool retailer with its ear to the ground on street culture. Uh, thanks for joining, Michael. Yeah, happy to be here. We're going to have a lot of fun. Michael, um, how'd you get involved in the customer experience spa uh, space? Um, well, for me, if you look back far enough, my resume, you'll see I'm a recovering actor. Uh, when I was in New York, when I got tired of waiting tables, I was lucky enough to find a startup, found my way into customer success when that was very new at the time. Um, bounced around some companies there across country, came back to Philly and was account management and customer success for a startup here in Philly. And then the pandemic happened and then I got laid off, uh, due to an acquisition, not even related to the, to the pandemic at all. So unfortunately no one was hiring at that point. I dropped success while looking for customer facing roles and found a really awesome opportunity here at Snipes, um, to join their customer service team, to start their customer service team. And then that's grown into customer experience over the last four years. So, uh, retail is a totally different world than SaaS. But uh, it's been a fun journey. Well, I, I find that a lot of people who were in um, customer experience uh, actually think of like retail as theater and retail as a, you know, I, I do think there's something there where people who have theater backgrounds naturally think about customer experience as, um, uh, uh, as a way to kind of um, deliver um, an experience, an emotionally engaging experience to people. There's something about theater that attracts pe uh, people into this space. You know, I think it's just maybe the collaboration and the people pleasing, maybe. <laughs> um, people have always said, oh, theater, you must, you know, that's why you're so great in customer facing roles. And I'm like, I, you know, I waited tables for 15 years. So I think that really <laughs> helped me out a lot more than uh, just being able to put on a face. But the similarities are there, right? Just uh, taking it in, listening and then giving something back to the customer. So where are you focused to drive the, uh, the best customer experience at Snipes? Right now, we're really focused on uh, building out uh, the customer journey. Of course, we've got it kind of post sales, but how do we get into that customer journey beforehand so that we can understand those expectations so that we can hit them, right? Uh, being in customer experience, customer service, People are only reach out when their expectations aren't met, right? So how do we turn those interactions back into data for the business to set those expectations correctly uh, at the time the customers have them? So a great experience is about that those peak moments in the experience where you great have the right emotions happen, right? Like the peak in the end, and and you want to have the right those right emotional uh, experiences. What do you think of for Snipes and you know and footwear and street culture and apparel? Like what? How do you think about that right emotional connection with customers on the journey? Well, we're really in the middle of that right now uh, with consumer surveys with different surveys on our website through just to try to understand who our customers are fighting off our own misconceptions uh, within our business that our customer is a younger male release driven uh, consumer. When I know that in customer service, we're hearing from grandmas, we're hearing from families who are going into our stores and really buying for the whole family while they're there. So just trying to turn that anecdotal uh, gut feeling into real data through surveys, through um, being out in the field with our customers. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense that you're you're building out the personas, you're building out the journeys, and you're trying to do this with different data sets, the research, the customer listening, the, the, the operational data, the experience data. I love the fact that you want to make it more data driven and not just a, a very simple, uh, like, you know, short research exercise, but make it more useful. Yeah, you know, we want this to be ongoing and to understand who our customer is over time, right? So we're making the uh, partnerships with IT, with our stores teams to make sure that we're hitting our customers where they are and getting that data back to us, expanding our social outreach and social listening tools 
uh, as well. So how has the way you approach customer listening then evolved as you've started to invest in some of these new tools like, you know, mining social media or getting beyond, you know, getting, being able to mine the open questions and surveys or into your unstructured data, like, but not just social, but calls or chat or how has the approach to social listening evolved and, and what have you been doing with those insights? Um, you know, it's really just been getting the ability to connect to our social media platforms. We've gone through a few iterations of that and how we're finding our customers there uh, and really finding that that feedback is very positive compared to like a post customer service interaction, right? Where they're already coming to us with an issue, but finding that in other places, our customers are really happy with us uh, and who we are as a brand and what we represent, how we keep our ears to the streets and bring it back uh, to the culture. So you just used the magic word culture. This is the CX and culture connection. Uh, you know, um, street culture is, that's a phrase you guys use a lot, is a key part of the Snipes brand, right? Um, what's the role of customer experience to reinforce your connection to street culture and, and your brand promise? Well, I mean, that, that's our mission is to advance streetwear culture uh, across the world and be the leading voice in that. Uh, we have an awesome marketing team that does a lot of great events and gives back to the communities that we're in. Something that makes me feel most proud to work for Snipes is we, we've got uh, Cracking the Codes, we've got dance competitions, uh, and we're out there representing in the communities, not asking for anything back. And, and that's what's helped really form a connection between us and our consumers. Um, we know they're omni-channel consumers. We know they're in our stores because they see us in their communities helping them out. In my um, book, the, uh, the CX and Culture Connection, which is also the name of this podcast, I talk about something I call an experience collage, Michael, which is my mom's an artist and I like to use uh, collage as a metaphor for customer experience. Just like we use journey as a metaphor because an experience is a collection of pieces you're fitting together that create more meaning like in collage artwork. And then the experience collage, I have this framework, which is that you want to get beyond the product alone right? That you want to be able to deliver a deeper, more meaningful connection. That's kind of moving along the X axis uh, from the product to beyond the product, or you, and you want to get from beyond an individual experience to a shared experience. So like if you think of the bottom left quadrant in this two by two, can't help myself as a consultant using a two by two. Um, the bottom left quadrant is a functional experience, like you're using the product or you're using a website and functional experiences have to be good, but they don't create a strong emotional connection or as strong emotional connection as they as others. And then deeper meaning is how does this project product add value in your life? What does it mean to you that you're using it? And often the content and the other things you're doing get beyond the product to like provide a solution that goes deeper. And if you go up, you talked about dance competitions, that's actually community, right? You're building community locally. So you're doing the experience collage. I, I like to think of, you wanna be in all four quadrants, which is usage, meaning, sharing, and community, all four quadrants. So like, my question then is, um, you know, how do you think about creating that deeper emotional connection? How do you know, how do you think about getting, tapping into more meaning, tapping into more sharing, tapping into more community shared some examples like dance competitions that a, are these, you know, a big part of your, your focus for CX to get beyond just like the product experience alone. Yeah. So as a, a street streetwear retailer, um, you know, the product isn't ours. It's Nike's, it's Adidas, it's Puma, it's, it's UGG, right? Um, and so that that's what we're selling is the experience that, you know, you can get those products anywhere. We have a really nice Snipes brand, uh, logo brand. They're very comfortable, but that's not what's bringing people into the store, right? They're there for the, the retros. So, um, that's why we focus so much on this community building on this culture building, uh, and make sure that we're out, out in our communities, helping them with gardens, with these dance competitions, um, coding classes, things like that that are saying, hey, we're here, we're part of this community, um, and hopefully you'll come back to Snipes. How do you get the, um, the store associates, the, your employees, engaged more in that experience with the, 
customer? And then how do you extend that beyond, you know, the store environment to get your employees more broadly involved in this? So it's not just the people organizing the event, but it's part of your overall cult culture at Snipes. You know, these are great recruiting events for us as well, for our stores. And we, luckily we have an awesome store operations team that is hiring people from the community who are sneakerheads, who are about the fashion, who are about the streetwear, who keep their ears to the streets and uh, want to be part of this community. We've got a great, great team of frontline managers and associates, district managers. Uh, they're actually all just here in Philly for our store manager meeting uh, last week and meeting them and hearing from them what's happening on the front lines. These people are passionate about what we're doing. They're passionate about being in their communities and creating a place where people can come and get the hottest streetwear. Um, and that's through our training, that's through our collaborations across the business. And um, you know, ultimately starts with our buying team and, and the product that they're buying to bring these people into the store. Michael, it's really awesome the way you're describing how passionate the employees are and, and the customers are and how there's this uh, connection between how engaged your employees are, that that cultural connection really energizes the, the brand and the way they interact with the customers. And it's not just the people in the store, the, the way it extends across the whole company. And I think that's really um, the focus of the CX culture connection, why I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I think, you know, they're just always generally saying, right, you keep your employees happy, you keep your customers happy. Um, and they do a great job of that. Here it's next. Yeah. Um, how do you see that being different across different pieces of the customer experience? You mentioned the call center versus the store versus people working on product or marketing or events or are there commonalities around like the culture and the types of behaviors that you want in the organization or, you know, across these different groups that you think about as you build the culture? Well, I mean, it, it all comes back to our customer, right? They're the ones who are keeping us all in business. So I've really made an effort to, yeah. I've got a weekly stand up, uh, just presenting this data back to the business. It's attended from by marketing, by IT, by our stores, by our warehouses. Um, making sure that they're getting the information they need about our customer experience. And uh, ultimately, if I can put dollars behind that and see where, you know, some dollars could be won or lost. And thankfully, the company's really rallied to that uh, meeting and it's always well attended. And um, just really continuing to build these collaborations across the teams to make sure that we're all focused in on that customer experience. So I love the way you're describing how you're engaging others in the organization to build engagement and drive value. And you're not just chasing survey scores. Like, you know, some people, when they do customer experience, they're just, their group is just, you know, it's, it's useful, but it's not driving as much impact. If what you're doing is just gathering customer listening data and then sharing reports on that, you're using that to build insights, to drive collaboration in the company, to drive impact. And, and um, what are what are some of the types of collaborations that you're working on that you think are most important in your role right now? Well, um, fulfillment is the big thing, right? That's what people come to us for is to order something online and get it shipped to them or go in the store if they don't have it. We, we offer shipping from there as well. And that touches every part of the business. That touches our warehouse, our other stores that we might ship from. It touches, um, you know, how do we market that? It touches obviously our, our IT and our dev team and it touches uh, all the way up to our buyers, right? How are, how are we buying and allocating these products? Are we putting them in the right spot that's most profitable for the company and best for our customer, right? Are they near the product that they want so they can get it in a timely fashion? You know, we're all a part of the Amazon economy, economy. where we expect things in a day or two and uh, so we need to make sure that our product is close to our customer where and when they need it. Yeah, I think that fulfillment experience is um, an important experience for many businesses. And during the um, pandemic recently, people's expectations got changed, not just because there was more e-commerce, but the, the fulfillment experience actually saw innovation with, uh, you know, look at Target and Whole Foods and others where people got conditioned to expect a really easy and high quality fulfillment experience. They weren't just going into the store to pick something up, 
you know, but they could get it curbside or they could, or people would come and bring it out to your, your, your trunk. Like it. And I think the, the, that, that innovation and in, in fulfillment experience got a, a big um, push forward in the last five years. Yeah. For us, you know, getting that buy online pickup in store experience was vital to, especially around last holiday when <laughs> crunch time happens, right? You can say, here's what's available near you. Um, and we're really looking at extending that to one day delivery options to um, ex ex expedited shipping, things like that. Beyond um, fulfillment, are there other areas that are, you know, are getting a lot of your attention these days? Um, automation, looking into how we can automate some of these customer requests. We've went through one partner where we're now with another and just finding that that really depends on your tech stack and how your tech stack works and communicates with each other, who wants to play with who. So um, as I've made a lot of learnings around those AI capabilities in the last year and a half, uh, working with our IT and our development team and you know, making sure that they understand the importance of this, not only is it, uh, not only is it a cheaper solution, but obviously it's a much faster solution. And for retail, you know, we ha have wild jumps in uh, our customer contact and our customer caseload from day to day, week to week, month to month, and especially around the holidays, right? It's a little hard to predict always when and where these uh, customer caseloads will pop up. We have a random sale one day by accident uh, that could lead to a huge spike in cases that we might not have been prepared for based on history, right? So having that automation tool is going to help us scale along with our caseload. So for the call center for you guys, is that mainly problem solving or is it also, is there an element of um, helping educate people and close sales there too? Um, it's mostly where is my order with most cases, uh, which are pretty easily answer answerable by AI, right? This didn't ship yet. This has shipped. It was canceled, whatever that might be. Um, but looking at other cases about, you know, automating, editing addresses, canceling some finding some self-service opportunities as well, which requires technology, which requires your other partners in IT and development. Um, yeah, so that that's where a lot falls in, but then obviously, hey, this came a little beat up, this you know, might not be the expected product, things like that. And then it's problem solving there where you kind of do need a, a human to walk through the issue, right? Yeah, but you raise a good point about, um, minutes you can save by either providing self-service, good web experience, good mobile experience, and then automating, you know, with, with chatbots, the ability to solve some of those questions and with, um, with the, um, and the, the challenges of keeping call centers and, and frontline employees, you know, engaged, you know, this helps you to grow and scale the business because you're a high growth business. So like to be able to do that without, um, you know, having to add lots of headcount, that's a big uh, saver. Yeah, I'm very blessed to have a, an awesome internal team that is very engaged and, and with our brand and has had low turnover. We've also got a great offshore partner that we're working with for um, overnight weekends, holidays, things like that, right? And they're also very engaged. So feeling very lucky there uh, as we continue to, to grow and expand. And, and we've seen high growth in the last few, four years. Snipes is a company from Germany that's coming over to the U.S. by acquisition. A few years ago, we company a, uh, we acquired a company called Jimmy Jazz, which at the time was just a little bit bigger than our U.S. operations. So that was a really exciting year uh, to bring those two companies together. Um, but you know, we're we're building new stores. We opened two stores today, um, so we're continuing to expand, and that just means more people getting to know our brand. You. Do you find that um, you talked about AI a moment ago and is your main use of AI to um, to automate and 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 you know drive adoption of things like chatbots? Are you using AI to to uh, summarize and and generate more insights or to personalize? Like what are the main use cases you're focusing on with AI right now? Yeah, right now we're just focusing in on those Wismo cases, which is pretty much an if then kind of setup. We're not into any LLMs or chatbots or anything yet. Uh, we do have a chatbot coming on the horizon that's based on some other tech work that's needed first, right? Um, but again, that would be also some very simple self-service that we're kind of expecting out of it. Um, 
just really want to get like that baseline servicing our, our customers' expectations before looking to expand to things. We have a lot of great recommendation tools already on site. So um, if we can try to bring that into the chat bot, you know, that's probably 2025, 2026. Um, but understanding that there's a lot of opportunity still ahead of us. There's a lot of hype around AI right now. What do you think's really ready right now versus like it's further on the horizon where you want to wait and see? The really simple if that, you know, we're very lucky in uh, that we are just a retailer. We're sending you something. Did you get it? Did you not? Was it up to the snuff? Do you want to return it? Right. These are very simple uh, scenarios to walk through. We're not a parts company that needs to fit this with that. And uh, so that I feel any of our AI needs are pretty simple at this case. Um, and hopefully in the future, you know, I'm sure it'll get more complicated as we start to bring loyalty in and things like that. Um, but that's really all I'm looking for right now. So I'm, I'm not looking at LLMs or what do people sound like, because even my team is using mostly kind of macros that, and then just adjusting them a little bit, right. When needed. So, um, I think I'm, we're lucky that we're not looking for anything too complicated. Yeah. I think there are where AI is, um, is really ready for prime time are some of the really simple applications you mentioned around automation. Um, and then you're starting to see um, uh, more advances in customer insight generation where you can mine the, um, you know, mine open questions so that the nature of a customer experience survey, they tend, they're becoming shorter, more micro surveys. You're able to mine a mix of closed and open questions where you get a lot more insight and juice out of the orange on some of the open questions than you used to. Um, and then we'll be able to integrate like the call center and the social media and the messaging into the uh, basically the unstructured data beyond the survey. Um, and then you can start, you know, train the AI to, to find insights that map to your brand better. Like one of the things I find really exciting is if you have a brand promise around street culture, there are certain things that you um, want to listen for and see what, what are the trends that customers are engaging around, but then also the language you're, that they're using so you can start tailoring the marketing and the content and the experience more closely to those different personas. And the AI is getting better at that, but it still takes time to train the models. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's why we're really making the investments into things like social listening that are helping build those word clouds and um, peaks and valleys on, on what people are talking about in and around Snipes on the social media platforms, right? Yeah, and I think it'll get better. I think that, you know, but right now I think it needs a, a hybrid where you still need a lot of human being involvement or, or otherwise you have to keep the model simpler. Like you said, if then, unless you're willing to invest a lot of time to train the model. What's next? Like, what do you, what do you think the next frontier is that where you're excited to learn and grow and, and uh, take your impact to the next level? Yeah, I'm just looking to really, how do we bring the customer data to all business units, right? Um, how do we know that our customers are where they are, what they want, what they're looking for? How do we bring that to our store teams? How do we bring that to our marketing team? How do we bring that to our buyers and allocators, right? Uh, to really say, this is what's hot right now. This is what people are talking about. This is what they're asking us about. We do get a lot of product related questions. Are you gonna have this? Are you gonna have that? Um, do you have these in this color? Why don't you carry this brand, right? And that we're bringing all that customer data to the different parts of the business in a timely fashion. So just to make sure I'm tracking, Michael, and also for the audience, are you emphasizing expanding your insights to be more actionable for different users in the organization to be able to do their job better? So you're partnering with them to deliver insights. Is that right, what you're getting at? Like yeah. around product and marketing and operations and other stakeholders that are involved in customer experience. You want to deepen the insights so they can team better on delivering value. Yeah, I, I feel that I'm the... I and my team are the interface with our customers, um, where they are and hearing from them directly and also the voice of the customer within the company. And how do we yeah. use that voice to serve our customers better? 
Yeah, because that that was one direction to go with it. Answer. I was testing to see whether because the other possible direction you might have gone in. They're both valuable. Is how do you measure outcomes? Right. So, like, if you know a, 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 a um, an NPS or CSAT or customer effort score is is not quite the full outcome. It's a means to an end. Right. And so, like, so if you if you're thinking about well, and how do we create business value? different parts of the business are going to have different metrics for what business value means for them. And then you might want to combine those experience data metrics, whether they're operational data and outcome metrics to get the right dashboards, the right met the right KPIs to track, to know you're improving the CX. Like the, the metrics you use for fulfillment experience be different than an in-store experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you were focusing more on the inside side of it than like the, how do we measure value and broaden the metrics to go beyond surveys? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe just, um, where we're at in my own organization is, is I don't have that data to match up against maybe in, in some regards. So I can only bring the insights, but I'm a big fan of finding a BI tool so I can put this versus that and that versus this, right. Uh, and just start to see what trends we can find together. Yeah, I think there are a lot of advances now on the uh, being able to integrate the data sets, like the experience and operational data, and not create like, um, uh, you know, the journey orchestration is getting better, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, so you're also a change agent. You know, you're, you're helping not only build insights, but you're helping engage others in the organization to drive, you know, focus on customer and drive new ways of collaborating. What are some of the lessons learned for culture and change management that you focus on for your CX efforts? Um, I think what I focus on when trying to make changes within the organization is just collaboration, which comes from my theater background, is getting people in a room, talking high level about some goals and how things relate to each other, bringing the data that I'm seeing that could influence uh, how we as a business approach a problem, uh, and then just getting buy-in uh, from wherever I can keeping those meetings on the schedule um, and asking for everyone's opinion. You're building the culture internally to, to help everyone make better decisions, be more collaborative, and, and that makes you guys more customer centric. Yeah, you know, like I said, I, I come from startup world, so there was never a path in front of me in a lot of cases uh, where I was just building out teams and building out processes um, and bringing that information back to the rest of the business. So when I first got here at Snipes, we, our e-com business was pretty small. Uh, we've now grown that over 10 times. And I think having that startup mindset of what's the next thing we can fix, what's the next thing we can fix or improve is a better word. Uh, you know, what else can we improve and build on from what we've got already? Um, it's just always been my mindset. I share that interest, Michael. I, um, I started in consulting, doing um, uh, focus on retail and consumer clients for digital, like, you know, e-commerce and loyalty and personalization. And then I got really interested in how do companies behave more like lean startups? Because like what a lot of companies were doing was trying to adopt more e-commerce and more agility and more uh, rapid insight generation. And, and the bigger companies are trying to behave more like the startup companies. And so like what I've learned over time is that you, uh, you need to broaden it from the digital to the physical, you know, the digital, and that like this agility is really about getting the organization to build a culture to work in new ways to, be, to to drive that outcomes you want. And it's really cool to hear, you know, you say, you know, you're you're taking your theater background, but also your startup background and you're using them to drive better collaboration to get the results you want and, and make it fun along the way. I don't know any other way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's working. Keep doing it. Right. Um, the, uh, do you have any other, um, you know, words of wisdom you want to share with the audience about, you know, people who are getting into customer experience and how to have an impact or, you know, how to, how to, how to fight the right fight? Keep asking questions. Um, I'm just always looking for curiosity in my team. And as someone who, like I shared my background, I'm not a customer experience expert, I would say in any way, I'm still learning a lot. I'm on, uh, discords. I'm seeking the internet, I'm seeking uh, podcasts like this one 
to learn more and, and uh, never afraid to reach out and ask for help or advice from anyone. Well, cool. If people want to get in touch, is is uh, Discord or LinkedIn? What's the best way well, to probably, communicate? Probably LinkedIn. I'm not really sure how to use Discord. I just know uh, I'm in some CX groups there where I can sometimes toss some questions in and get some feedback. Cool. Well, yeah, LinkedIn's always works really well as a way to get in touch. And uh, I really enjoyed having you on the podcast. You've definitely sparked some great ideas for me, and I hope I know you have for the audience as well. So thanks for uh, joining, Michael. Thanks for having me.